just seems like yesterday. <laughs> well, please be seated. <laughs> and I would like to start with a, a statement here. I'll start by saying it sure is good news to have Nancy back home, and she's doing just fine. Over the past several days, though, we Americans have watched the stock market toss and turn. It's important that we understand what is happening and that a calm, sound response be the course we follow. While there were a couple of days of gains after several days of losses, we shouldn't assume that the stock market's excess volatility is over. However, it does appear the system is working. So while there remains cause for concern, there is also cause for action. And tonight, I plan to take the following steps to meet this challenge. First, I will meet with the bipartisan leaders of Congress to arrange a procedure for deficit reduction discussions that will be productive and constructive. I'm appointing my Chief of Staff, Howard Baker, and my Treasury Secretary, Jim Baker, together with my OMB Director, Jim Miller, to lead the, the White House team. And I urge Speaker Jim Wright, Senate Majority Leader Robert Byrd, Senate Minority Leader Bob Dole, and House Minority Leader Bob Michael to appoint their representatives so this process can begin immediately. Second, I'm putting everything on the table with the exception of Social Security, with no other preconditions. And I call on the leaders of Congress to do the same. This situation requires that all sides make a contribution to the process if it is to succeed and that a package be developed that keeps taxes and spending as low as possible. I am able to announce tonight the final deficit figures for fiscal year 1987, which show a reduction from $221 billion in fiscal year 86 to $148 billion this year, or a deficit reduction of $73 billion. This change occurred not only because of a one-time improvement in revenues, but because of a reduction in spending. Third, I'm calling on the members of Congress to join with me in sending a strong signal to our economic partners that trade markets should remain open, not closed, and that America will withstand any calls for protectionist legislation. And fourth, I'm creating a task force that over the next 30 to 60 days will examine the stock market procedures and make recommendations on any necessary changes. Heading up this three-person team will be former Senator Nick Brady. When we faced challenges before, this country has resolved them by pulling together. And now is the time for all of us to take a good hard look at where we stand as a country and as individuals. Adjustments can and will continue to be made to keep this country on the path to fiscal prudence and continued economic strength. And now, Terrence, questions. President, the stock market plunge demonstrates that there's a crisis of confidence about economic stability and the leadership of our government. Are those fears warranted, and how serious is a threat of a recession or something worse? Well, first of all, the indices, the index that is used for judging whether we're sound economically and so forth, uh, has been up and increasing 10 of the last 11 months. And with the great employment that we have, with the fact that we have reduced that double-digit inflation and uh, the prosperity that is ours out there, the, the one thing out of such a happening as the stock market that could possibly bring about a recession would be if enough people, without understanding the situation, panicked and decided to put off buying things that normally they would be buying, postponing purchases and so forth, that could bring on uh, something of a recession. It's happened before. But I don't think that there's any real reason for that. The, I think that this was a long overdue correction, and what factors led to its kind of getting into the panic stage, I don't know. But we'll be watching it very closely. I approve very much of what the exchange is going to do with regard to the next uh, three days. Uh, uh, that the market is trading is going on in quitting two hours early to give them a chance to catch up with their paperwork, uh, which is the reason for that. But uh, this is, I think, purely a stock market thing, and that there are no indicators out there of, of recession or hard times at all. 
Let me ask you, sir, also, why did, your, why did you change your tune on tax increases from over my dead body to keeping any increase as low as possible? Well, I am going to meet with the leaders of the Senate because it is high time, after about six and a half years of trying, uh, on my part, I know, to bring down the deficit and get us on a path, which the graham rudman hollings bill was supposed to do for us, toward a balanced budget. And uh, if that was any factor in shaking people's confidence, I'm going to meet with them. Now, they will have an agenda. They will have their program. But I have mine. Now, I submitted a budget program early in the year. And as they've done every year I've been here, they simply put it in the shelf and have refused to even consider it. But my program had $22 billion of additional revenues in it. I have said additional revenues. There are other things you can do that are not a deterrent to the economy, uh, such as taxes can be. But what I've said was, all right, I'll listen to them and what they have in mind as an answer to this problem. But I expect them to listen to what I have in mind. And uh, the bulk of these $22 billion have nothing to do with taxes. As a matter of fact, uh, I could claim that we have about $5.5 billion of that 22 already, and the Congress has said, I can't use it for lowering the deficit. That is the sale of assets and debts that we have accomplished just in recent weeks. But, uh, uh, President, your uh, Persian Gulf policies have caused a widespread confusion and fear that uh, reprisals on both sides will lead to wider hostilities, more terrorism. Did you miscalculate, and uh, is there any limit to these policies? I'd like to follow up. Helen, I don't think that we miscalculated on anything at all. We're not there to start a war, and we are there to protect neutral nation shipping in international waters that under international law are supposed to be open to all traffic. They, on the other hand, the irrationality of the Iranians, now they have taken to attacking, as they did with this most recent incident, that was Kuwait and an oil loading platform offshore, uh, which they fired evidently a soakworm missile at and caused damage to it. Uh, we are simply, we've said that if attacked, we, we were going to, we're going to defend ourselves. And we're certainly going to continue this task. And we've now been joined by a number of other nations in keeping the, uh, the sea lanes open. But uh, I don't see it as leading to a war or anything else. And I don't think there's anything to panic about. I think we've done very well. President, uh, you said you, you don't think the War Powers Act is constitutional, but uh, do you think that you have the uh, right to, to obey the laws that you pick and choose? Well, other presidents have thought so, too. As a matter of fact, there's, we are complying with a part of that act, although we do not call it that. But we have been consulting with the Congress, reporting to them and telling them what we're doing and, and in advance, as we did with this latest uh, strike. But they have other things in there that we think would just be, would interfere so much with our rights and our strategy and so forth. Let me point out that since 1798, there have been a few more than 200 military actions by the United States in foreign countries. Now, we have only been in five declared wars in our entire history. About 62 of these more than 200, the, there was uh, action by the Congress, uh, either by through appropriating funds for, for those acts, or um, uh, passing resolutions, or Senate ratifying a treaty or something. But the bulk of them, uh, the, somewhere around 140 of them, were by American presidents that on their own put American forces in action because they believed it was necessary to our national security and our, and our welfare. Uh, yes? Mr. President, despite your earlier answer, it's been made clear by you and your aides that new taxes are a possibility as you go into these negotiations on the Hill. And many of us are wondering, in 1984, you promised not to raise taxes. And you may recall that same year, Walter Mondale uh, said that uh, it was time to level with the American people. He said, Mr. Reagan and I will both raise taxes. But the difference, he said, was that you wouldn't tell anybody. Now, aren't you going against your own campaign pledge if you're about to negotiate the new taxes? No. 
And uh, you, you have me in a spot in which I don't feel that I can continue discussing these things or future actions because for about a quarter of a century I was doing some negotiating with, for a union uh, against the employers. And you don't talk in advance about strategy or about what you will or won't do or there's no point in having the negotiations. So I just want to tell you that uh, when we negotiate, I'm going to, I've, as I say, on my side, I've got $22 billion. Now, $23 billion is all we're looking for uh, in a reduction. And uh, the most of mine, as I say, are, are revenues that are not taxes and all. But let me also point something out that I think all of us ought to understand why I feel so strongly about the tax situation and resorting to taxes to cure, curb a, a deficit when they'll do nothing of the kind. In all these years of these 59 months of expansion, our tax revenues, now I believe that this expansion we're having is largely due to the tax cuts that we implemented early in our administration. But for all this period of time, the percentage of revenues is about, well, it's about 19 percent every year of the gross national product. Now, the gross national product has been increasing in size quite sizably, so that if we're getting revenues that are still 19 percent of that larger gross national product than the smaller, it would indicate that uh, the revenues are sufficient. But the problem is that the, uh, the deficit is, or I should say, wait a minute, the spending, I should say, of gross national product forgive me, the spending is roughly 23 to 24 percent. So that it is, incre it is what is increasing while revenues are staying proportionately the same and what would be the proper amount they should, that we should be taking from the private sector. And uh, I think that this is something we have to consider if we're going to maintain prosperity. I will say this with regard to taxes or sources of revenue. They must not be something that has an adverse attack effect on the economy. Well, up on that, Mr. President, do you consider some taxes perhaps less harmful than others, perhaps sin taxes, alcohol, tobacco, are they less harmful to the economy than a, perhaps an income tax increase? Well, let me just say that there are some taxes, such as the income tax, that have a more definite effect on the economy than some other taxes. But uh, I'm not going to discuss anymore what we're going to do in, in this. Uh, Mr. President, let's stay on this if we can. On Monday, you said, despite the plunge in the stock market, that the economy was sound. On Wednesday, you said it had turned around. Now today, you're ready to meet with the Congress. What's caused this transformation after months of refusing a budget summit? No, I haven't been refusing. I submitted, as I have to every year under the law, a budget, and a budget that provided for revenues, as I've pointed out here. And the Congress wouldn't even look at it. And the manner in which we arrive at our budget is so much different than anything the Congress does. We, with the men and women who have to run the programs that are the heads of the departments and the cabinet members, we spend weeks and hours every day for a long period of time with them and their expertise in running them, de deciding how much money they require to perform the task the governor, that the Congress has imposed on us with that program. Then we send that up to the Hill. And those congressmen who don't have any idea about running those programs, they just voted to pass a program to do a certain thing, they turn around and say, oh, no, you need millions of dollars more uh, to achieve the objective than you've asked for. Well, I think it's a kind of a stupid setup. And uh, this is what we've been trying to do for a long time, is arrive at the ways in which we can reduce spending and so forth. But uh, now, uh, we, with the Graham-Rudman-Hollings uh, program, with the sequestering provision that has been passed, uh, uh, we have to get together and make a decision. If Trudy? I, if I can follow, sir, I'm wondering if it took a crisis to bring you to the point where you were willing to meet with Congress, and whether if you had met before, you might not have in some way averted the, the market crisis this week. No. I. <laughs> I think it's been a crisis ever since that I've presented a budget and that they never will even look at them. If they had looked at our budgets 
Last year, the cumulative deficit would have been, if we had they'd passed our budget, would have been $207 billion less than it turned out to be. Trudy? Mr. President, yeah. what kind of cooperation are you getting from the Soviets in restoring some stability to the Gulf and in ending the Iran-Iraq war? Well, the Soviet Union joined us in 598. That was the, as you know, the UN resolution, the Security Council. Um, they, they joined us in that and supporting that. Now Iran is the only one of the two that uh, has refused to accept it as yet. We're still pushing on that before we move on to the second uh, initiative, the, the follow-up, which was what do we do if they won't accept it. We're still uh, holding back on that because the uh, Secretary General of the United Nations is still seeing if he cannot persuade Iran to cooperate. If they don't, then we will have to face uh, in the Security Council the adoption of the second proviso, which is the arms embargo uh, on Iran. But they have been cooperative, and they did go along on the uh, resolution. But, uh, are you punched? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what are the prospects for a peace uh, conference under joint U.S.-Soviet um, sponsorship? Oh, well, that <laughs> we're um, we had thought and gone along for a long time with the others that believed that the Arab nations. We're still technically in a state of war with Israel, that they and Israel could get together and should get together. Some of them have, such as the great efforts that, the, that uh, King Hussein of Jordan has, how far he has gone to try and bring this about. But it just hasn't worked, and more and more uh, the word has been uttered that uh, we should form an international group to help them come together and bring peace. And uh, we finally have gone over to explore that uh, that's what the Secretary General has, has been doing in the Middle East. And uh, so far, uh, Israel uh, prefers not to go that route. They, they, uh, yes. yes. Uh, Mr. President, earlier this week, the U.S. attacked an Iranian oil platform in the Gulf. But despite that, today, Iran fired another silkworm missile on Kuwait. Do you really think you can stop the Ayatollah? Well, the Ayatollah is in a war. And if he's going to go on with provocative acts against us or anyone else, then he's running a great risk because we're going to respond. We're not going to sit there. And uh, we have to feel, feel that uh, on the basis of everything he's said and everything he's done, that if we did not retaliate as we did recently, he still would have done again what he did the first time. We're going to try to point out to him that it's a little too expensive if he's to keep that up. If I can follow up, when this whole operation started, the U.S. had five ships in the Gulf. Now you have more than 30 in the area. Can you set any limits on the U.S. involvement in the Persian Gulf and tell us how long this escort operation is going to continue? No, I can't tell you how long that will, but I can tell you that I believe we're just the same as we have a fleet in the Mediterranean and we have one in the Caribbean, other places of that kind. We've had, a, we've had naval forces there since 1949. and. We have to have them as long as it is necessary to take action to keep an international waters open to commerce and trade. And no nation has a right to close those, particularly when it's not involved with their enemy that they're at war with, but when it's neutral nations. Uh, it, to restore public confidence in the economy, do you think it'd be a good idea for you to urge more of the big banks to lower their interest rates that a couple have been doing uh, this week? Well, I think so. they have done that on their own, and I think it was a very wise thing to do. What about business itself? Do you think the businesses should lower some of their prices and take a little bit less profit to encourage more sales? <laughs> uh, I'm not going to make suggestions like that to them. I think that's, that's up to them. And as I say, there are no, there are no so sound signs of deteriorating economy out there in the economy. We have the highest percentage of the pro potential workforce at work employed today than we've had in the entire history of the United States. Oh. All right, Sam. Now. Mr. President, I've listened to what you had to say tonight, and it's still not clear to me that you will accept and agree to a budget compromise package that contains higher taxes. Will you? 
Sam, as I've told you, I can't discuss in advance what I will or won't do, but I'm going to tell you I have not changed my opinion about ever accepting a tax that will have a deleterious effect on the economy. And uh, most tax increases do. Taxing is not the policy with re or the problem with the deficit. The deficit is due to too much spending. Every dollar of increased revenue since 1980, and that means including our tax cuts, every dollar of increased revenue has been matched by a dollar and a quarter of increased spending. Sir, you feel very strongly about this, obviously. Yeah. You've been, you've been the, one of the leading proponents of supply-side economics. What went wrong? What went wrong with what? Supply-side so economics? Why are we in the economic mess that we are in today? Because for more than half a century, that was dominated entirely by the Congress, of both houses of the Congress, by one party, they have followed, beginning with what they call the Keynesian theory, deficit spending. Openly deficit spending on the basis that they claimed it was necessary to maintain prosperity, that you had to do it, and that it wasn't hurtful because we owed it to ourselves. And some of us said, year after year, that this would keep on to the point that it would get out of control. And it has, just as we said it would. And they've got to give up that belief in that. I think I'd like to point out to them that Maynard Keynes didn't even have a degree in economics. The uh, the Democrats who did it? What? The Democrats who did it? Uh, well, you can look up and see who dominated both houses of the Congress for the last 50 years. Mr. President, you've taken uh, great delight in your appearances over the last six months or a year in saying that there will absolutely be a veto of any tax increase that reaches my debt. You've said that in a number of different ways. Now, in light of the crisis on Wall Street this week, are you going to stop saying that, sir? You're all trying to get me into saying, what am I going to do when I sit down at the table with the other fellas? And I'm going to tell you that I'm going to do what I think is absolutely necessary for the economy of the United States. And I still happen to believe that taxing is something, well, I think it's what brought on uh, the troubles that we had when, when I came here. Well, sir, then it sounds like you're still basically opposed to any increased taxation, whether you call it revenue increases or tax increases. No, there are many revenues that, uh, sources that we pointed out. I'm in favor, I'm in favor of uh, a number of service, uh, pay for services. That there are some things the government does for, say, a particular group of people, a service that's performed. I don't think that the taxpayer should pay for that service when it is limited to one particular group. They should pay a fee for that service. You're still against tax increases? Uh, <laughs> they'll find out when I sit down there. Mr. President, uh, while your budget talk has been conciliatory over the past few days and a bit this evening, earlier this week you flatly blamed Congress again out on the South Lawn for the deficit. Doesn't the White House equally share in this mess? Well, just a minute. The President of the United States cannot spend a nickel. Only Congress can authorize the spending of money. And for six years now, I have repeatedly asked the Congress for less money, and they have turned around and given more, given more to spend and done it in such a way that I can't veto it when they put it all together instead of appropriations in a continuing resolution. We haven't had a deficit or a, a budget since I've been here. No, the Congress is the one that's in command, and I, we have to persuade them that what we've asked for is enough to support the programs as determined by the people who work those programs and who run them. And uh, every budget that I have sent up there has been put on a shelf, and I have been told that it's dead on arrival. And then we are faced someplace after the first of the fiscal year with a continuing resolution containing 13 or so appropriation bills. And I think that I was perfectly justified in saying that the president is not responsible for this. You can go back all the way to 1931 and we've been running deficits. There's been, there's been dissension and disarray on your AIDS panel. Even Cardinal O'Connor, one of the most prominent members, has said that he thinks perhaps his time should be better spent 
working against this plague on the local level. What are you going to do about this? Well, a couple have quit. We're going to replace them. We have uh, we've appointed a new uh, uh, chairman of the, of the commission. We think that it has to have a variety of skills because it's a very complex problem. So we have as much representation as we can get from the business community, from medicine, from education, and so forth. And uh, we have two vacancies to fill, and I'm still hopeful that we'll learn something and find out if there are more things and better things that we can do with regard to this terrible plague. We have spent more money every year, increased it, on AIDS, and next year, or the, well, in the present fiscal year, now that October 1st has passed, uh, we'll be spending over a billion dollars on AIDS, and we, I think we need a commission and someone to help and advise us in how best we can spend that money. Do you think, sir, that the panel will be able to finish its report on schedule? I'm hoping that they can and have to assume they can. Now, this gentleman here. Yes, uh, Mr. President, uh, back on the economy and uh, trade, your comments tonight on trade. Many economists think that one quick, surefire way to give the economy a big boost would be to create, in effect, a common market for North, North America. Now, you initiated these talks with Prime Minister Mulroney and Secretary Baker recently completed the negotiations, but the pact, the Canada-U.S. trade pact, is being vigorously opposed, in, especially in Canada and in some parts of the U.S. Is there any way that your office can be put behind this to give it the needed push? Oh, you bet that I'm behind it. The problem is right now there's a parliament in Canada also that has to pass on it. And I understand they're somewhat reluctant about a few points. I think the trade agreement that we reached with them is one of the foremost things that has happened in this area in, in history. Here we are, these two great partners, and we're the greatest, we're the greatest trading partners in, in volume uh, in the world between us. And this would be just a, a tremendous step forward for all of us. Well, sir, to follow up, uh, would you be willing to go back to Canada and try and get some of those uh, Canadian legislators together and uh, talk to them as you just have here? I'm not sure that I could do any better with foreign legislators than I'm doing with our own. <laughs> Andrea? Uh, Mr. President, now that an INF deal is all but wrapped up, the next step would be strategic weapons. The Soviets have said that they are willing to give you the big cuts in those missiles that you've always wanted if you would agree to some limits on strategic defense testing. Now, a lot of experts have said that that would not require slowing down the program for the foreseeable future. Why have you told your negotiators that they cannot even discuss this issue with the Soviets? Because if you put it on the table as a bargaining chip, then it becomes a bargaining chip. And we have said that this, a, the, a real defense against nuclear weapons, can be the biggest factor in hopefully one day making those weapons obsolete because I heard my own words come back to me the other day from Mr. Chevronazzi when he said to me what I've said a dozen times and to some of the parliaments and legislatures of the world, a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. And the best and way to ever bring that about is to perfect this plan, which we think can be perfected, and then be able to say to the world, here is a defense against nuclear missiles, and we'll make it available to the world in return for the world giving up nuclear weapons. Well, with the likelihood, then, at least of a summit here in the United States to do, sign the treaty on the medium-range missiles, what kind of summit do you envision with Mikhail Gorbachev? What would you like him to see in this country? And where would you like to take him? And how do you think that would affect superpower relations? Andrea, we don't have a word yet or a date yet as to whether he's coming. We, we have a belief that this is going to take place. And uh, I want it to take place very much. But also, I hope that when it does, that he's never been to this country before, that he would have time to see a great deal of America. And uh, I think it would be good for him to see this and to see things that he couldn't accuse us of staging them for him. Let him see it. Now, yes, I've thought about knowing something about the quarters that they uh, have for beach homes in the summer and so forth. Uh, I've thought it would be ni kind of nice to invite him up to our 1,500-foot adobe shack that was built in 1872 and let him see how a capitalist 
spends his, <laughs> his holidays. Hey, you. Yes, yes. No, no, no. Yes, you. Well, um, comment on the book of confirmation. You said if they reject him, I'll give them someone they will dislike just as much. That seems a defiant statement. Both you and the Senate have fulfilled your constitutional duties. The people exercise their democratic privileges by um, expressing their opinion. The majority of the senators rejected Judge Bork, and according to the uh, polls, the majority of the American people. So while it appears you, your defiance was aimed at the Senate, weren't you in reality defying the working of democracy in America while advocating democracy around the world? I think that this selection of a judge, what it, you were referring to as democracy, I think was totally out of line with what the procedure should be. We were not electing a political figure that could then be turned out of office by someone's votes and to, for the first time in history, to go out and have private interest groups of various kinds pressuring individuals to vote a certain way on this. What I meant was that I will try to find if he is, is turned down when they vote. And we have had the testimony of some of the greatest minds in the field of law in the United States, and including the former justice and all, as to his qualifications. I will try to find somebody that is as qualified in the same way that he is. I think that this thing was politicized, and I think that Judge Bork was one of the first ones that said, regardless of what happens to him now, we must all make sure that never again does this process that has been so dignified as a confirmation by the Senate of an appointee of the President turned into a political contest as if people were voting on it. And uh, I think if you would compare the qualities of the people who testified for him and their qualifications, I should say, not quality, I think they were far superior than most of the people who were against him. Um, you said it was politicized. It wasn't politi politicized from the beginning because of the fact that I remember about two years ago when Senator Paul's um, Tribble asked the Black Bar Association of Virginia to recommend a black person for a federal judge. And I'll quote from, um, from Senator Paul uh, Tribble's letter. He said, recommend someone who shares the, the conservative philosophy of President Reagan. And it's pretty hard to find a black, you know, to kind of uh, share that. So, uh, and then, when you, you said again that you had pressure interest groups, isn't that what happens in America, these pressure interest groups? I don't know whether you're talking about the civil rights people and the women and all. They're American citizens, and don't they have that right to do so? And then, well, I guess I have to answer well, those questions. If, if it was to be that way, then once, then we would have early on decided you would elect judges by public vote. And they decided that that was probably not the way to get those with the best qualification. But on the racial question, I realize that there are some who believe that somehow I have a prejudice in that way, am I a racist? And I, that is one of the most frustrating things to me because I was on the other side in that fight long before it became a fight. And I would like to point out that the head of CORE, the Committee on Racial Equality, was one of the witnesses testifying on behalf of Judge Bork. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like to get some, sir? 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 Would you like to get Mr. President, 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 M